Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak this evening? Please state your name and address. Jill Congdon, 298 High Street. Um, just wanted to let everybody know again that this Friday at Troughton Street School from 10 to 11.30 will be the PTA-sponsored orientation. Um, so Troughton Street School, 10 to 11.30, and West Street School will be 1 to 2.30, open to all parents and students for the schools. All children must be accompanied by an adult, but we're all set and ready to go for the orientation and can't wait for everyone to come to our scavenger hunt. I would also like to say that on the um, Southbridge Elementary PTA, there's a link to the Southbridge School wish list, which teachers have been encouraged to go on the wish list and put different um, items that they need for school. Some wishes have already been met, but um, Anybody in the community can go on to this school's wish list and help teachers by donating classroom supplies. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Donovan. Yes, thank you. Through you to, um, to Mrs. Congdon. Will the teachers at these orientations be present? Is this a time for the children to meet their teachers or only some, maybe not all? Um, teachers are not required to be there that day. We welcome if they do wish to attend, but um, students will not be meeting their teachers. Um, we, the PTA, will be taking photos of any teachers that will allow their photos to be taken tomorrow, and we'll be posting the teacher's picture outside of every classroom at Charlton Street and West Street School. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public who'd like to speak this evening? Anyone else from the public? Seeing none, we'll move on to meet, we'll call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Present. Mrs. Donovan. Present. Mr. Lockwell. Present. Mrs. McLaughlin. Present. Dr. O'Leary. Present. Mrs. Principe. Present. Mrs. Woodruff. Present. Seven present. Thank you. Agenda item number five, report of the business manager, Mr. Wiggins. Okay, uh, this evening um, at the request of the committee, but also it's that time of year where it's a good thing to do. Frankly, uh, we invited uh, AA Transportation to give the committee and the public an update on the transportation. As you know, with the new school opening, the new middle high school, but also the reconfiguration of our elementary schools, really the transportation system for the Southridge Public Schools is entirely new uh, when you get right down to it. Um, and uh, before I uh, bring Ron and, and Linda up to the, the podium to speak more intelligently about the transportation system, a couple of things I'd just like to say to the public. Uh, it is the time when I get a lot of phone calls with concerns about a bus stop or uh, various transportation issues. Um, if you have called me or you are e have emailed me, you are on my list. I will be getting back to you. Um, be patient with me, please. We try to get it all done before the opening of school, and it is always our goal. Um, so, and it is my goal, so um, in the next few days, people will certainly be hearing from me and hopefully we'll get um, back to everybody and, and get their issues addressed. But um, without uh, further ado, I will bring Ron and Linda up to the, oh, I guess I'm bringing Ron. Linda's gonna be shy. <laughs> and Ron, I'll let you introduce, introduce yourself a bit more formally. Uh, my name is Ron Ernenlein. I'm the president of AA Transportation. We are the current uh, contractor for the town of Southbridge providing all your transportation. Uh, Mr. Wigan did speak uh, regarding the, the significant changes to the uh, transportation structure this year, um, and I, I guess that's a little bit of an understatement. Um, it it uh, essentially is a brand new system, uh, and for the first time ever, we're transporting 100% of the middle school, high school students so currently, 100% of those students have been uh, assigned to buses. Um, and because of that population that we're transporting, uh, we did need to add several vehicles to the fleet to have the capacity to achieve that. Um, one of the other changes that's occurring is on the elementary tier, um, we have split up uh, so that four buses go to each of the elementary schools uh, rather than having all the buses go to all the elementary schools. What we found in the previous years was that there was a lot of time being spent uh, traveling from school to school uh, under the new system. 
Uh, the route should be a little shorter, uh, with less uh, commuting. Uh, did, did you have any questions? Well, I, I think one of the challenges that we've been facing, and maybe you want to speak a little bit to it, Ron, and we continue to challenge, is one of the things about your policy um, is that when we measure distance that a child is eligible, it talks about um, eligibility being, for example, to, to pick the second through fifth graders as an example because we know we transport all kindergartners and first graders regardless of distance. But for second graders through fifth graders, uh, their eligibility for transportation is whether or not they live a mile or more from the school, or excuse me, more than a mile from the school they attend, or if the babysitter child care provider they have is a mile or more from the school they attend. And I, I'd kind of like Ron to kind of address some of the challenges we've had in addressing some of the morning pickups from babysitter child care providers and some of the PM issues because a lot of our child care providers happen to be in one of the two districts, uh, and that being the Charlton Street District, which means that there are West Street children that conceivably either need to be picked up or delivered to a child care provider in Charlton Street. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about some of the well, challenges you're yeah, facing. My, my comment regarding that is um, that it, it has been a little bit of a challenge and um, kind of aspirated by the fact that the information is coming in, you know, very late in the, yes. in the game. The, the routes were all established and now we're going back and adding child care providers. And um, like you said, you're correct. Uh, and we're finding a lot of cases where um, you know, the, the buses that serve the community school in that, you know, area or district in the town, now the child care provider is on the other side of town. So, uh, you know, we're having to route those buses over, uh, you know, across town just for that, uh, just for the daycare. And, and part of the reason I want to bring it up is because we will be bringing the policy to the committee, to the policy committee for review. Um, I think, albeit we might not implement those changes this year, there's some changes nonetheless that I think I would like to propose to the policy committee and ultimately if the policy committee agrees to the full committee for consideration. Um, but I think it's also important to know that AA has been a wonderful partner for this district for many years. And uh, again, they have been responding to this challenge magnificently. Um, um, but it is a challenge. Um, Thank you. One point that I think that I, I may have failed to mention that I think is important to note on the middle school, high school, when I said that we trans we're transporting 100% of the population, the reason for that is if you take your mile radius around those schools, um, you're going to find that those uh, roads and neighborhoods are not suited for walkers. Um, there's no sidewalks. It's just not a safe thing. Uh, and uh, it was actually kind of nice because the population isn't very dense there, so it, it didn't have a, a major effect on, on the, uh, the routing of the buses. But we thought it was important to include transportation for those children so that they wouldn't be uh, at risk trying to walk on, on those streets. Mrs. McLaughlin? Hi. Uh, to you through the chair. Um, a couple questions just for clarification. <coughs> Will there be buses after school for kids that stay at, late after school for academic reasons or for sports activities, as we've heard? And also, is there a bus that will be transporting uh, students to athletic practices across town after school, is that? Yes, that's, that's the plan. Um, you know, we have that in the works. Okay. Thank you. Any other, Mr. Lazo? Can, <clears throat> to, the, to the previous speaker, um, Lauren's question was almost too part. I understood that it was in the budget to have athletic practices and everything because we don't have use of the fields. Um, the good question is, after school, is there any busing just for after school? I mean, I'm talking yes. about the educational use, yes. the purposes we had, of the building? We okay. had built into the, the bid a late bus. Okay. Uh, and initially, what we're going, to, we're going to try it as one bus initially. Uh, if we need to expand that, we will expand it further. Um, it, it's, it's the first time we've really had a, a late bus, so we're not quite sure what the demand's <clears> going to be. Uh, it may even ebb and flow a little bit, so we're, this is the first year, so we're going to have to kind of feel it out a little bit. Um, it will, the way I'm envisioning it to work is that it will, it won't be a bus that, it, there'll probably be like two or three, well maybe, I don't know, maybe more than two or three, but there'll be like some sort of mega neighborhood stops for the late bus. It's not going to go, it's not going to be a big involved route to drop off. 
but it will get to the major neighborhoods and there'll be sort of one central place where kids in that neighborhood will be dropped off um, on the late bus. I, ideally, we'd have a, a designated route or stop list and then the, the kids that get on the bus can choose which stop they want to get off, but then right. we, we know where we went to drop them off. Um, you know, rather, I've seen in some other districts that the late run routes are uh, kind of, uh, they change daily and, and you know, it's not designated stops and that, I, I don't believe that's a safe practice. It's always good to know if your child takes the late bus exactly where they're going to be able to get dropped off and then you know where to meet them or, or, or where to, to look for them. Uh, Ron, is it similar to Bay Path where they have a, a, like in town we have a lot of Bay Path students but there are like one in front of the town hall, there are certain stops that right. pick up for the region, is right. that what it's like right. when it come back to get them to the walking areas? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have about seven. We have about seven stops on that route. So. Mrs. Donovan, thank you. Through you to Ron. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Um, I have many questions. I didn't know if you wanted me to do them one after another or do a couple. Give somebody else a turn. No, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, my first question, getting back to the the daycare issue, um, do we know for sure who those AM pickups are, or is it up to the parents who have children? in daycare that will be at that daycare center in the morning to inform the school to let them know. They need they to need let to us know um, prior okay, to Because currently the list that we have, a lot of the stops say PM only, and I didn't know, is that a daycare thing, that those are daycare right. drops only in the afternoon? In some cases, but for the most part, daycare stops and babysitter stops would not be published stops. Okay. Okay. They're, they're not okay. going to show up on that list that we publish because they're really pretty identified and pretty specific. And I do want to make a designation. If, if for example, we have one child who is being, uh, going to a babysitter, it's just sort of a one child going to this place, in all likelihood that child's going to be dropped off the stop that's nearest to that babysitter. Okay? It's not a door-to-door -door delivery because we don't do door-to-door -door delivery. The daycare stops are usually situations where we might stop at a daycare, but that's because there are five or six children okay. that as are being bused there. As long as you there. know yes, where they are. Yes, we do. Okay. But if you, if you are a parent out there that has children they, in daycare, it's best to call you to make sure they're on the they, list. They, their, their starting point would be at the school, and what the schools are instructed is if they're not sure that the stop has been established, then the schools will contact me. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, my second question was, uh, just for clarification, because I know a lot of the schedules have been mailed home, I think people in town are used to the actual bus stopping in front of their house. And in this case, some of, a lot of the neighborhoods are going to be clumped together, there'll be one stop. But there are specific addresses listed, so are those addresses the places where the bus will actually stop in front of that home? And if that is not your address, then you go to the closest corner as designated on the list? Is that the exactly. proper way to read the, the schedule? The, the actual stops are listed on the route sheet. So if it is an address with a number, that's where the bus will stop. Um, okay. Otherwise, if it's at a corner, it'll be indicated on the route. Okay. Um, do you happen to have the schedule in front of you? I do not. Okay. But uh, do you have it with you? No. Okay. Then I can, I can ask that question separately to Mr. Wigan. Um, I also was wondering, there's a section here for Trinity Catholic Academy as well as Southbridge Christian Academy. Mm -hmm. Are there specific, are there three, I think it's in three columns, and I wasn't sure, are there three separate buses or are no. they all on one bus? They're, they're all on one bus. And it's... Yeah, that's just the... the it's just so it would fit on this on one page. Okay. And print it out. Okay, so but there's only one bus for both of those schools. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Linda, thank you. All right. Item number two is the school facilities update, West Street School. Yeah, we're actually going to update on all of the schools, but I know that there's obviously some issues uh, that have been going on this summer with the West Street School. So I'm going to ask Mike to come up and introduce uh, the representative from Cushing, Jamello, and Wheeler, who's going to give us an update on the work that's being done at the West Street School with the oil spill. Good evening. Joe, if you want to come up. This is, uh, Joe Jamalo from Cushing Jamalo uh, Wheeler. Um, 
he can give you more detail if you want detail, or just an update of where we're at, uh, where we came from, and what's expected to, uh, uh, we're going to have in the future, what needs to be done uh, until this process is completed. Hi, again, um, I'm Joe Jamalo. I'm one of the owners of Cushing, Jamalo & Wheeler, environmental consultants that are uh, working for your insurer and in the town. Um, I think you are aware of, of what happened in early July, and since that time, we've been doing assessment work and some cleanup work. Um, the assessment has included um, soil sampling, in, in the basement. We've actually uh, cut through the basement floor in the boiler room. Uh, that's been a substantial thickness of concrete, but we finally accomplished that and we've excavated soil down to about four to five feet below the floor. We've taken out about 25 tons of fuel impacted soil. <clears throat> um, the Currently, the basement floor has been um, filled in with pea stone. We're going to leave those cuts in the floor open and those areas that have been cut are, are being or have been covered with plywood so anybody that needs to go into the boiler room can work on those. I'll get to why it's being left like that in a moment. Um, but under the boiler room floor in the areas uh, beneath or to the sides of some of the pits that we have dug, there is still substantial impacted soil there um, that will have to be assessed and likely removed. Um, the second thing that we've done is installed some wells outside the building uh, on the lawn on the West Street side. There are three wells there. Uh, <clears throat> one or more, maybe two, have shown impacted groundwater with fuel oil. Um, so I wanted to let you know that. Um, we have also um, pumped a good deal of water uh, from b beneath the basement floor. Initially, <clears throat> up until uh, today, that was pumped outside to a, a large a white tank you may have seen sitting on the lawn. Um, that is being changed. Uh, today we had delivered a metal container, about a 8 by 20 foot or 10 by 20 foot uh, container that is going to have equipment inside that. We will be continually pumping uh, impacted water from um, beneath the floor of the basement to that trailer and treat it and then that will be discharged to the sewer system. We just uh, heard today that uh, we obtained a permit uh, from the, um, uh, the sewer treatment plant to do that. The uh, reason that we need to do that is because we need to control the flow of water. We have impacted fuel, fuel impacted water beneath the school. We don't want it to start flowing appreciably in any particular direction. Um, and certainly by removing that water, it accomplishes that, plus it uh, removes the impacted water. Um, We've also sampled the indoor air in the building, and there are um, the sampling that we performed were in numerous classrooms on the first and second floor, and that showed um, that there were no risks and school could continue uh, as scheduled. Um, with that, I'll leave it open for, open for some questions. Um, Mrs. McLaughlin. Hi, good evening uh, Hi. to you through the chair. Um, How's the water quality in the building itself? Is it safe for drinking and hand washing and those kinds oh, yes. of things? Oh, yes. The water that's beneath the school is not associated with the water in the distribution system in the school. That comes from the municipal system. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lazo. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you're going to continue to aerate uh, through the stone and pipe that is placed. Uh, why are you not capsulating it with the uh, concrete and doing a plow? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I did not follow up on that. Reason being is that we need to go back into the boiler room, um, into the soil, to, the so to um, be able to access the soil beneath the concrete floor. Because in the future, and we've, uh, we will coordinate this with Mike, 
we will have to come into the school during vacations um, uh, and as time allows for us to remove further impacted soil. There's impacted soil uh, underneath the boilers, as a matter of fact. Uh, we, you know, we need to be very careful on where we cut. We've had a structural engineer involved because obviously we don't want the floor to fail uh, or anything like that to happen. And uh, obviously, as I said, we need to be careful, but there is more impacted soil that needs to be removed and we need to take more samples. Um, there are, <clears throat> I, I do some work um, with companies, um, encapsulation and, and removal. Isn't there a way that you could treat that soil in place? I know it's expensive, mm -hmm. but instead of because it is a school and because of the situation with the boilers, could you not treat that soil in place and then encapsulate? That is a possibility. Uh, we're, not, we're certainly not ruling that out. Um, however, given the timing of things, we needed to get um, the floor back into some working condition given that school is about to start. So while we will continue to assess, we'll take more samples, there is a possibility that um, in addition to the removal of soil that we've already done, we will certainly look at other options such as yeah. treatment. It's a, it's a difficult situation, it being a school and when we close down and where it's located, so I just thought you know, yes, that was- Yes, absolutely. Good. Thank you. Dr. O'Leary. Questions. Can you uh, can you translate 25 tons into a volume? Yes, it's about uh, 28 tons. 28, yeah. It's about 18 yards, 16, 18 yards. So, uh, dump trailer. Well, a dump trailer is ten what? Thir ten. It's about a ten wheel load. Ten. Hi. And is it? And, um, and it wasn't very easily done. <laughs> I should. No, I'm just trying to, I don't know what tons means in, yes. I know what tons mean, but not in terms of volume and dirt, so now I know, thank you. And can you assume, or can you make any conjecture as to, uh, from what you're finding now, was the, the um, degree of uh, leakage or the, the amount that was leaked is, do we have to re revisit that number or are we stuck on? Uh, no, know, um, from the information that Mike supplied um, and that we gathered, um, we're, fairly confident that the, the gallonage um, that was calculated was probably the case. Um, you, you know, that boiler room has been in existence for many, many years. We don't necessarily know, and, and you probably don't necessarily know what could have happened in the past, but, right. you know, there, what we found was extensive impacted soil beneath the floor. Uh, extensive laterally and vertically, mm. and um, the groundwater. I mean, given that the groundwater is impacted outside the school, so. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Mrs. Donovan? Yes, thank you. Through you. Um, my first question is the equipment that we see that's on that front lawn as we drive by, will that remain there while school's in session? Is that part of the process? Yes, that equipment, and by the way, I fail to note that there will be an eight foot high um, wooden fence around that metal container. That will remain there um, while school is in session until we can stop pumping. It's, it's going to be some time before this whole um, assessment and cleanup is actually closed out under the state re regulation. Okay. That was one of my questions. Are you involved at all with the state DEP with yes, this? Yes. Uh, I'm actually a uh, someone licensed by the state, it's called an LSP, that stands for Licensed Site Professional, and I am the LSP on this project. Okay, okay, very good. And my last question is, is I have not been in the school recently, is there any type of odor that will, it's, no. it's getting I mean, into any of the No, I mean, there certainly initially was an odor in the boiler room. Um, one of the first things we did was put blowers in the boiler room to exhaust um, the fumes outside, and um, as, as I indicated, we wanted to uh, provide some assurance that the air quality in the school was okay. Um, certainly by exhausting those fuel, fuel vapors and um, doing some remediation or cleanup to this point, um, that has helped a great deal. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, a little clarification, Joe. Um, 
Well, she asked equi uh, all the equipment that's going to be on the front lawn. Hmm. My understanding, the only thing that's going to be on the front lawn is going to be the trailer itself. Yes, the, the only uh, equipment that will be on the front lawn is the trailer. While there will be equipment inside the trailer and the fence around it, you will not see anything else. And as an example, the piping that's going to be coming from inside the boiler room from the, the pumps that pump the, the impacted water, that's all, gonna, that's all underground. Okay, so if there is a concern relative to students or whomever else in an, or around the trailer area, th there should not be an issue there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ely? Just, just one question. With that mitigation going on right outside the building or that, that machinery, is there going to be a noise factor in the classroom? No, the, um, the pumping system should be very, fairly quiet. And, and the qu second question is, if the teachers on that side of the building open their windows with the heat, is there going to be a fume issue? N no, there, there are no okay. fumes. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much, sir, for coming tonight. Okay, thank you. Okay, the rest of the buildings, they look good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, West Street, we're working on uh, replacing some sidewalks. Um, there's some concrete slabs that were uh, broken over the winters and moved around, and um, so we're ripping those out, and uh, they start working on that today. Uh, they told me it'd be done by this weekend. The um, move, we're still moving. Uh, we still have teachers um, that haven't come in yet and some that are just coming in and they're saying, I need this, I need that. So we're still gathering furniture and uh, boxes from here and there. Um, we get three more days. It's, it's been a rough go. They, the, um, this, 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 the temporary help that we had this summer, um, excellent, 110% every day. Um, my staff, I, they, they almost outshined my staff. They, uh, they did very well. It was well worth uh, getting them on board. We wouldn't be where we are right now if it wasn't for them. Uh, a lot of moving. Uh, and we still have, I think, maybe four to five still that are left with us. The rest have gone already back to college. We're taking a little break before they're going back. Um, but. Um, we're looking good for the most part. I'm, I'm sure when school starts, we'll still be moving a few things around. Um, a lot of teachers noting that they don't have as many files as they thought they had, or they have more stuff than they had files for, um, is usually the case. But um, uh, the rest of the schools um, look good. Um, all shined up, ready to go. So, anybody questions for any particular schools? Or? Any questions? Nope. I guess we're wrong. I will say, Mike, nope. let me just tell you, I've been in all the buildings now uh, multiple times, and, and I just want to commend you and your staff <coughs> because I know how much we've demanded of you, <coughs> and I know that uh, your guys have been working very, very hard, and the buildings look great, and I think our staff appreciates it. I know our, our parents will appreciate it. I know the administrators appreciate it, but thank you and your staff. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, I know there's still a lot of work to do, and, and uh, the demands will still be there, but uh, right. for now, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lazo? Just a quick comment. Uh, it was noticeable, uh, if I could just tail end off of uh, Eric Ely. Uh, the summer help, the students, I mean, your staff is your staff, and they're always polite, but the professionalism that the younger kids had in those yeah. buildings, especially at the new high school, they were orderly, they were respectful, people were passing through. It's a, it's a tribute to their parents and themselves yeah. for uh, uh, a great job, but most of all, their, their whole appearance and performance was outstanding. Yeah. Real respectful. Yeah. They were they were, um, read the riot act from day one. And <laughs> <laughs> they followed through well. Very good. Thanks. Anyone else? Thanks, Mike, for coming. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Item number three is the proposed risograph lease, Mr. Wiggins. You have a. Um, memo in your packet um, and again a, a brief history here when I came here last year and um, started working on the budget you review a lot of different things and I reviewed the leases that we had on copiers and risographs and it quickly uh, came to my realization that um, under Massachusetts law I said I would never say that but I guess I have to <laughs> um, the leases that have been enacted um, three years ago were illegal 
um, because they were five-year leases. And there was actually in one case there was no record of it ever coming to the school committee for an approval as a multi-year lease. But um, if a lease under state law is more than three years, it has to have the, author the approval of the town's legislative body. So if you're a town meeting town, it would have to have town meeting approval. In the case of Southbridge, you of course have a town council, so it would require town council approval. Uh, I worked with a town manager, that never happened. So those leases were illegal. In the case of the Rizzo lease, which we're talking about tonight, and it's one of the leases, of, and I'm working with RICO as well to correct their lease, um, but in the case of the Rizzo lease, a second problem was that the lease was a five-year lease of used machines. So imagine that three years ago we were leasing for five years used machines. Um, what is before you tonight is a way of not only correcting the lease, but I think a win-win for everybody in the sense that the schools not only are, get the fact that they will actually have Rizzo's that are leased legally, but they will have brand new, state-of-the-art, net workable risograph machines. Um, the lease numbers are basically the lease cost for a year, 7,200, excuse me, for 12 months, $7,239.36. For the first year, however, for the first 12 months, there's a deal out there. And let me kind of lay out the numbers for you as far as what the impact would be for fiscal year 13. Because we would only be paying 10 months of the first, 12, first year's lease, if you will, in FY13, the cost that we start with is $6,032.80. Now, we've budgeted to pay $966.80 for a lease. That's the old lease number. We also have a maintenance contract, but because these are new machines, they have a one-year guarantee. So I would not need to pay the $3,080 that we've been paying to maintain those used machines in the first year. And by the way, in future years, the maintenance contract will not be nearly as extensive because they're newer machines. And it also comes with $1,615 worth of free supplies, which actually is more supplies than we actually purchase in a year. That makes the net cost the net new money that I have to find in the FY13 budget to implement this lease this year, $371.40. It's a fair market value lease. At the end of the lease, these machines would go away. We would look to lease new machines. That is the way to buy, and, or not to buy because you never want to buy copiers and risographs, but to lease copiers and risographs because basically at the end of three years, they're trash. You want to get rid of them and you want to get new ones. So you never want to lease to buy. And you certainly don't really want to own. That's something we want to get away from. So I am recommending tonight that you approve this lease. Um, again, it gets great new equipment in all of our schools and it corrects a legal problem. That really is not our problem. I could simply say that, well, we're not going to honor the lease, but that means that there will be five risographs that go away because they will simply go back to the manufacturer. Any questions? Yes. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Yeah. Dunner, Mr. Wiggin. Yes, thank you. Um, if you could just help me with the math a little bit, Mr. Wiggin. Yep. Um, you stated that the first 12 months for all five machines would be 7,239. Correct. We're looking to, uh, one of your recommendations is to allow the lease for an amount not to exceed 603.28 for the 36 months. Now, right, that's, six, that's 603, the 603.28 per month is what the number is that was quoted by Rizzo, and that was attached to the memo. I went back and checked that. There should have been in your packet a memo, looks like this. Yep, have that. Okay, and you'll see that. After he nets it all out, this says total 603.28 per month. Okay. And that's for the five machines. I think where I got confused is you were talking about all those offset costs for the right. first year. Because I was taking it and I was trying to build it up into its total annual cost. What Rizzo does is they give it to you as a monthly cost. So our total annual cost is the 7239, but there their monthly go. cost is the six. Okay. There you go. Okay. And my other question, um, I, I might have asked you this before, I don't remember. Will these um, new Rizzos have the color option? They do not have the color they option. Do not. They did okay. check on that. I was pretty sure they didn't because 
but when I just looked at the model number, the 220 is a, it's, it's actually more than a basic because now they're networkable. Okay. Which is a, a great, the, the administrative assistants will love that because no longer do they have to necessarily walk up to the Rizzo to create the master, but um, it is still a black and white machine. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. This is Principe. Yes, um, Madam Chairman, would you, um, Chairwoman, I'm sorry, whatever I said, um, <laughs> would you like a motion after whatever these items are that require a vote because um, they're not elsewhere on the agenda? Uh, yes, I would like a motion after each one that we speak about if we can. So tonight's motion, we would need a motion for the Southbridge School Committee to authorize the school business manager to enter into a three-year fair market lease agreement with Rizzo Incorporated for five new EZ220 printer duplicators, said lease to include buyout of the current five-year lease and trade in five current Rizzo digital duplicators in an amount not to exceed $603.28 per month for 36 months. Do I have a motion? Thank you, and do I have a second? Second. Thank you, so we have a motion by Mrs. Principe and a second by Mrs. Donovan. Is there any other discussion? Mr. Lazo. Just a quick question. Um, Madam Chairman, our agenda was supposed to be the report of, uh, just make sure, I don't know, Terry, if you can comment to this. Mm -hmm. Is it proper to vote under the report of the business manager? Yes. Uh, well, so I, I, let, me, let me be for, uh, that was a little too quick. I will tell you that your agenda format in Southbridge is, is somewhat unique to me. What I'm used to in other school districts in Massachusetts uh, is that if I do a report and there's an action item associated with it, but for that matter in any part of the agenda, um, is that action is taken. Well, well I'm under the impression that uh, if there is new business, we could take it under new business. I'm just not sure under the report of the business manager, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, normally, we, you know, and I, I, the intent is to get things done tonight, so I want to get things done also. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, again, I would, I would yield to the fact that in Georgetown that was done, in Dracut that was done, when I was trained by the Attorney General, the Attorney General indicated that this was appropriate. The idea of the open meeting law is to warn if you are potentially taking action. You do not necessarily need to warn that as a separate and distinct part of the agenda. And, and, and that's why I'm asking that question, because on the bottom of, of uh, most of your paperwork says this, you're requesting a motion. This one's the one that doesn't have a request. That's the only reason why I bring it up. Uh, yes, it no, this does. one has yes, a request. Oh, I shouldn't say this. Yes, it does. I read it right from the. OK, I'm sorry. Yes, it is here. Yeah. OK, I'm sorry. No, nope, that's here. OK. Dr. Domingo. had to do with uh, regulating how, why, when agenda items can and should be added to the posted agenda since they were not posted 48 hours ahead of time. I just want to make sure that whatever action we might be taking is acceptable. Uh, and I don't know how we deal with that tonight. If nobody is, knows exactly what bothers me is that it's not even as we have action or new business usually on the agenda that was not posted on this agenda tonight. And I don't know if that is acceptable for public purposes. It's, it's really, you know, we might be vote, voting a whole bunch of things and it may not mean anything. It's, it's well, not my sense to delay anything, but we need to make sure that the open meeting law is actually, is actually addressed properly. Well, I, I was told that it was fine for us to do it, but I can certainly take a recess and make a phone call um, to D. Moskis. Mr. Uh, the, as far as the posting portion, uh, I'd like to comment, it being on the agenda constitutes posting. Correct. My, my, my question is, is genuine that I'm just not used to voting under this, and if it's all right, I'm good with it, but we've never done it before. I don't remember. Maybe we have. I, I think part of the reason this is a little different is the type of meeting. It is, it's not a regular school committee meeting. It was actually posted as a business meeting to deal with the business items. Um, yeah. I can certainly, like I said, I can certainly take a recess. I can call Glenn Kucher from MASC. I have his number, and I can double check with someone if you'd like. I believe that we're doing appropri it, it appropriately. I think so. 
Mrs. Thank Prince Bay? I, I just, I believe, it's my understanding, if there is an agenda item, a motion can be made mm -hmm. on that agenda item. I think the fact that we have normally in a regular school committee meeting an area that, that says school committee action, I think that's just um, something unique to our district. I, I firmly believe if it's on here as an agenda item, an act, a motion can be made to take an action on it. That's what my understanding is. Mrs. McLaughlin? Yes. Oh, um, if it's not too much trouble, I'd prefer clarification on this. Just okay. Then I will take a recess and I will make a phone call and get this clarified for everyone. Thank you. We'll take a five, ten minute recess. Right.
Thank you. I'd like to reconvene at this time. And um, I did call Mr. Glenn Kucher from the MASC, um, and he has informed me that as long as the public and everyone was informed that this is a finance meeting, that we can vote on anything related to the finances because the agenda was out in time for the public. So we can vote on all the items that need to be voted this evening as finance items. Mr. Lazo? Uh, just, just a point of clarification. I think we're customary, we're, we're so used to voting, like some of these items are not votes and right. some of them are votes, mm -hmm. and we're so used to going over to uh, committee action, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why when I mentioned that there was one that doesn't have a vote, it was the van, so, I mean, it, as far as open meeting law, it's posted and enlisted, it's just, it's just a different structure that we're not used to. I, I looked at it and I didn't know either, so. No I'm, problem, I'm good. I'm thank good with you. It. All right, Mrs. McLaughlin. Is the motion still on the floor? Is it still an active motion? The motion is still an active motion on the floor, Can correct. I comment on it very quickly? There is a discussion, yes. Um, I ran into a teacher, an elementary school teacher, and the timing on this couldn't be better because uh, she informed me that for two or three days she was trying to get a hold of one of the copiers and they had various uh, breakdowns and issues with the copiers. So I was actually happy to see this. Um, uh, because of uh, we're moving to Common Core, curriculum materials are not necessarily purchased and teachers have to create them themselves, which means they're going to be doing a lot more copying, laminating, and making up uh, things to go along with their curriculum. So I think the timing of this is good. Um, the economics are sound and I'm going to support it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? No other discussion? Can we have a roll call on the motion, please, Max? Do you want me to repeat the motion or are you all set with it? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Dr. Domingo? No. Mrs. Donovan? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. McLaughlin? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Six yes, one no. Thank you. Motion passes. Our next item is item number four, the proposed van purchase. Mr. Wiggins? I would ask that we pass over this, and I will hopefully have this for you at the September 11th meeting. I could not get the purchase option information in time, and I'd like to consider that so that I could give you the recommendation of lease versus purchase. Thank you, all right. Next item is item number five, confirmation of the FY12 prepayment of tuition. Mr. Wiggins. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, folks who were on the previous school committee uh, will recall, but I will, you know, for new committee members, uh, in my financial reports throughout the year, I would update the school committee and will update the school committee this year again on our financial balance and as we get towards the end of the fiscal year um, I make notes of where we may be able to spend certain money and one of them is to prepay tuition and under uh, we are allowed to prepay up to 40 percent of any student's uh, tuition under state law for the following year and it's a way to create some flexibility in a budget particularly if you have a budget that has been reduced or was tight and you have a positive fund balance that you anticipate um, we anticipated that we would have about $84,000 that we could use for prepayments, but because there were difficulties in actually getting a firm fund balance before June 30th, we were never able to actually take the action at that time. Uh, when we did finally get uh, a firm fund balance, there was clearly plenty of funds available, and I'll talk more about that in an agenda item towards the end. Um, so I took the liberty of encumbering $85,315.05. It's encumbered. We have not paid any invoices. That is up to the committee to authorize. And I am recommending that you authorize that tonight. The monies would come out of FY12. We have the invoices. Uh, if you don't, um, the money will simply revert to free cash. Um, and those tuition bills will be paid out of this year's budget. Um, so it is the committee's decision. Uh, I think it's prudent to pay them out of FY12. And I think it is truly something that we were all kind of anticipating prior to June 30th, but unfortunately we couldn't do it at the time. So I am obviously recommending that you approve the motion. Mr. Lazo? Uh, just a question, Terry. Um, when we go beyond June 1st, I know prior year bills we've had in, in, in the past, once mm -hmm. you go beyond June 1st, there's no uh, problem with going beyond June 1st and finding it after the end of it's, the It's been encumbered. Year. What's that? It's been encumbered. That's it's why been encumbered it's before? been encumbered. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Dr. Domenico. 
Madam Chair, through you to the business manager. Uh, Terry, the reason this number was encumbered at the time was because that was your best guess? Uh, because it, it seems very arbitrary if you look at the sum, 85, 315, the, That number represents, and I have to apologize, I should have looked up this number. It is either 12 or 13 students' first quarter payments to the collaborative. So these are precise payments. The, the reason I'm asking is, you're going to address that in number 10, is that this, the amount of, of funds actually that was left over is significantly larger. And I know in the past but we I, have right. we have voted to prepay tuition not only on collaborative but on some significant tuitions but for out-of-district at the time I was At the time I was able to encumber, I was unsure what that number would be. And that's the reason that's why the reason. larger? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mrs. Donovan, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you through you to Mr. Wigan. Um, Dr. Domenico might have answered one of my questions. I was just wondering about past practice. Is it the practice of the school committee to normally do this prepayment of yes. tuition? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think, I think, for example, the previous fiscal year, uh, I want to say it was 134000 <clears throat> and I think the year previous to that, it was actually closer to two hundred. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, and a follow-up question. Um, there, this tuition cost is a... Uh, I'll call it a, fi a fixed cost, so to speak. There's no discount that gets applied if you prepay. Is that no. correct? Okay. Uh, uh, sadly, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Mrs. Principe? Through you to Mr. Wigan. Um, you stated that you did not have a clear fund balance. Is correct. that due to the KVS system? Yes. It and we, you will address that later, yes. that issue? Yes. Because we seem to be having an issue. Yes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Lazo. It's a year later. Uh, it's, it's a year later, and Terry, have we, maybe we should make an effort to sit down with the town side and just get rid of KVS, maybe? Well, actually, we're, we're doing a couple of things. And one of the things is on the 13th and the 14th, KVS is coming here. And as I understand it, it may be the first time that KVS has actually come here to do training. So we're going to start by giving them a chance to tell us if we're doing something wrong. Now, I'm pretty sure some of the issues we're having aren't training issues, but I'm a fair man. Sounds so good. We're, we're on it. All right, so we need a motion this evening to allow the Southbridge School Committee to authorize mm -hmm. the school and business manager to expend $85,315.05 from the FY12 budget for the purpose of prepaying out of district tuition. Do I have a motion? So move. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call, please, Max? Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Dr. Domenico? Yes. Mrs. Donovan? Yes. Mrs. Lazo? Mr. Lazo? Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Mrs. McLaughlin? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Seven yes? Thank you. Seven yes. Motion passes. The next item is the disposal of surplus items. Mr. Wiggins. Ma ma Madam, uh, oh. Madam Chairman, yes. can we, this is what's confusing. We should make a motion for us to, second it, then discussion and presentation. I think that it, I'll make a motion to okay. move that the Southbridge School Committee authorize the Southbridge Business Manager to sell or dispose of the above listed items in such manner that in best interest of the town of Southbridge. Second. So we have a motion and a second. second. Now do we now have a discussion, okay. please, Mr. Wiggins. Uh, again, you have a memo that describes this. What we are talking about exclusively here are items that are damaged that would have no value to sell or to use elsewhere. Um, and I'm going to anticipate a question in advance because um, it's been raised by a couple of committee members and it's a very valid question. The question was raised whether or not some of these items have already been disposed of and the answer is yes. And let me explain why. Um, this is basically salvage metal. Uh, Mr. Como and myself and, and the town manager met and discussed that this is essentially what this item would be. The item, the revenue from this, these items goes back to the town, doesn't come to the school district. And so the, we began by simply putting them into the dumpsters and we were going to wait and have you folks vote on it. We then had people stealing it. We've actually had contacted the police and the police are investigating two thefts. I made the decision, I stand by the decision, that I was not going to take the chance of having more thefts which would cost the town money. So as we filled the dumpster with items that clearly were not going to be anything but salvage metal, 
I had those dumpsters hold away. This is an inventory of the items that either have already gone or are pending to be to go if we haven't already taken them. But again, I assure you that there is nothing that has gone that is anything but salvage metal. Anyone else? Mr. Wazo? I, I got a request from the Art Center uh, for an overhead projectors. If you have, I know we bought a lot of we, equipment. We, we have a few. Okay, uh, if we could get two or three over, I, I would deliver them to the art center. I mean, uh, yeah, some no of the problem. equipment uh, and we've doubled up on, and that there are community uh, organizations that might use some of the equipment. Would, I know there was a request. And if, if I may, mm -hmm. that actually raises a good question, what's going to happen to the rest of the items? The, the first thing, obviously, is we're going to see what we're going to reuse in our elementary schools yep. or, or at Cole Avenue, or because, uh, you know, again, we're working with the Head Start to come into Cole Avenue. Um, um, you know, or other, other locations. Uh, then we will typically talk to town departments, okay? There may be things that town departments, you know, may be able to need or use. But then I think it, Chris and I have talked and you and I have talked about the idea of, you know, is there a process whereby we can, you know, offer some out to civic and, and church organizations? And then ultimately at the end of the day, um, Chris and I have talked about a couple of different things, including if it's possible, maybe even before we send it off to the state auction or something, to maybe do something local, to allow local people a chance yeah. to maybe, you know, if people would like to do something like that. So, yeah. Dr. D'Amico. Madam Chair, through you to the business manager. Uh, it, there's got to be more on this list that eventually will make oh, yes, it absolutely. to the school committee. My question is, is there anything that we are reusing in the new building from the existing two yes. schools? Yes. What would Quite that be? Um, there will be a fair amount of computers. Okay. Um, there are some of our newer file cabinets because there were some file cabinet needs that we were not able to address. Um, there are... White boards, overhead no, projectors? No, not really any white boards because that's all new. Uh, not really any projectors. Well, oh, actually, take that back. There are a couple of short throw projectors okay. that we did take out of the old school that are going into some of the smaller classrooms because we didn't necessarily buy short throw projectors for every small classroom. Um, I would. There are there are some small pieces like even if you have a big whiteboard in your room, some of the teachers use like the smaller portable whiteboards or chart pads. So I mean, those types of things we didn't really buy new on. Those things are still up there. Uh, going up there, um, there's uh, there's a lot of smaller items that uh, I know initially the way the um, administrative assistance uh, areas were designed, there wasn't a lot of draw space for them. So on a temporary basis, they're using some uh, items that we brought up from the old high school. Uh, there is actually some furnishings that are coming in for them. Any of the science equipment that we have? Microscopes. Oh, yeah. All okay. that. Oh, yeah. All that's going? A, a lot of the science equipment scales. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. okay. A, 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 wind I, say what? The wind tunnel. The wind tunnel. <laughs> the, um, what was the other piece? The, the uh, water table. Water table. Uh, it's gone up there. Uh, some of the hand tools okay. that we had in the old shop have gone up to be used in the new tech ed lab. Um, that, that's it's quite a list, actually. I, I think it's important for the community to know that we're not just abandoning these oh, buildings, no. that, that a lot of things are being right. moved, even though there's a lot of new and, stuff, obviously. And, um, and, and, and again, some of, those, some of the technology items will, right. that, we, that are not going there will be going to elementary schools. Yeah. And then, for example, at Cole Avenue, one of the things that we've done is we, for example, the KVS training I spoke of, um, you folks here know of the, I guess we would call it the language lab. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to be able to do the KVS training in that language lab, which is going to be really cool to be able to have not only okay. school department people train, but the town folks are going to train with us. <clears throat> so we're going to be able to use that language lab as a training facility. So there's a lot of, a, a lot of reuse of technology. I, and other I, I think that's really critically important. The town uh, really extended uh, extended their mm -hmm. help when we needed it most a few years ago and outfitted this district with $1.4 million or something like that with in new mm -hmm. technology. And I think we owe it to mm -hmm. not only to the town administration but to the public to justify 
you know, that that money not only was it was it spent and used while it was in the building, but that we have rescued whatever Agreed. rescued still can be for the future use. Agreed. And I, I, I really would like to see uh, if the superintendent's office produced, you know, a summary uh, that we could put in the newspaper, wherever, that we could advertise, you know, what was done with all this, what, what is coming with us, what was left behind and for what reasons. And uh, so we can, mm -hmm. you know, the community need can appreciate what we yep. have done. Thank you. Mr. Lazo? Uh, <clears throat> just a point of information. I know in the early stages with the building committee and the, we had an ad hoc committee, there was a lot of stuff going on. We're in kind of a unique situation. Uh, the new school does not have a lot of storage. Uh, the state will not let you build a school with a lot of storage and you'll notice when they go to school, it's gonna be the number one complaint. But what's, Southbridge is in a very unique situation with although using some of the uh, newer stuff that we had from the old buildings and then we're using the new stuff, we have these buildings that we don't have to exit immediately. I think the superintendent and, the, and the, uh, the business manager has walked these buildings, and I know the reuse of Southbridge High School. There's a lot of different things that could happen, but what's unique about it is a lot of this surplus, I'm hoping we're going to get a surplus list, probably bigger than this later on. Um, what's nice is we can concentrate on moving in the buildings the way we're supposed to move in, and then maybe during the year we can... Uh, Yes. sort out the odds and ends between the two buildings because I know Wells is going on the market or has been on the market and uh, we'd like to take of um, you know whatever we need out of that building and, also. And there's actually some exciting things that were able to happen too because for example uh, a lot of file cabinets were left over but that created an opportunity for us because right now we have archive files in lots of different places including in this building in what is affectionately referred to as the milk room in boxes. Well, now in the old high school, we were able to create um, in the second floor in one section, I'm affectionately calling it the uh, records suite because there are three rooms that all lock and then there is kind of an entryway that also locks. And we'll be able to take all those records and obviously we will sort through because some can probably be disposed of, but those that won't be able to will no longer be in boxes. They'll actually be in file cabinets and we could actually find them, which would be something that would be very handy. Anyone else? Mrs. McLaughlin? Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate all of this and I support it. I don't like taking a vote on something if it's kind of already happened though uh, as a pro forma. I appreciate that. So my question is, is the company that removed these items securing them until we vote and that sort of a thing? Are they holding them in abeyance I, or are I they would, already? I would, I would have to say in all honesty, probably not. Okay. So again, I take the responsibility for that. Okay. Um, so has the district been paid? Or the, the town, town has, has the town the town has been paid. The yes. town has been paid. Okay, do you know how much? That I don't have a record of because that is something that goes to the town. I can find that out and report back to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Again, I just um, it's I, a don't, fair, I, I don't like voting on something a, that's already taken place. It's a fair criticism and I apologize. That's but okay. Mr. Ely. Thank you. Just to let the committee know, uh, in last spring I asked our technology uh, uh, personnel to make a, uh, an itemized list. And we had an inventory we done do. for do. the entire district with the existing technology. So we do have the technology have list if you would like to see it. Yeah. And right now, as, as I know it, we haven't gotten rid of any old technology no. except technology that has been laying around broken for quite a bit that we haven't, we pretty much scavenged all the pieces that, that we could. That actually, we do have it, we do have it now for the first time, an actual uh, uh, actually, itemized list of, of things. Yeah, I was going to say, the only technology actually has been disposed of is last year, you may recall, I brought you a list of items to be disposed of. That's the only technology that has been disposed of. Any other discussion? Mrs. Donovan. Yes, thank you. Through you to Mr. Wigan. Um, I know that there's a bunch of surplus items that are currently in the gymnasium at the old high school. Correct. Is that uh, all of the surplus items that we have, or are there others? No, there's still items from Wells that will be moved up there. Okay. Uh, the, ultimately, they were all going to, the, the high school, the old high school, Colav, will be the repository uh, for us to have people come and, and look and we'll distribute out from there. So at this point, still nothing has been inventoried. We're still in the right. process of accumulating. And then, for example, the there are other types of items. For example, uh, in Wells, the uh, kitchen equipment. We're in the process of moving that to the various elementary schools. Um, and actually, in one case, we're playing a little shell game. There are kitchens at the existing high school that better fit in one of our elementary schools. Um, but in return, there are, there are ovens at Wells that better fit with the high school. So again, Mike 
you know, Mike was kind of, you know, he's got a lot to do, and that's part of the lot to do that he's doing right now. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else for discussion? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call on that? Dr. Domenico? Yes. Mrs. Donovan? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. McLaughlin? Abstain. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodrow? Yes. Six yes, one abstain. Thank you, motion passes. The next item is of the proposed before school program. Do we have a, um, we'll need a motion for the Southbridge School Committee to authorize the creation of a before school program at the Eastford Road Early Childhood Center, the Charlton Street School, and the West Street School with the intention that said programs be grant funded. Be it further moved that if grant funding is unavailable for any reason, that a fee of $4 per day per child be established for participation in the before school program. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. And do I have second. a second? Thank you. And discussion on this item? Any discussion? Mr. Wiggins, would you like to just yeah. go over it a little bit? Very briefly, um, this has been, I think, I think actually a couple of years ago, we used to have a program at Charlton Street School. Uh, if maybe uh, at all the schools, but essentially this was a concern that we have had and under the new rules of Title I, you have to reserve a certain amount of the Title I grant for certain purposes and one of them is before and after school programs. Um, as it happens with the kind of reconfiguration, obviously the, some of the academic needs that we have in the district, um, our elementary principals got together and approached me and said we'd really like to start a before school program uh, to run between 7.30 and 8.30, I believe is the hours. Um, and their concept I thought was a very sound concept, uh, two teachers in each school. Um, and again, the idea is not to simply have something where parents can drop off early and, and get, you know, have an early drop off. The idea is that these children would get academic support uh, and enrichment in that before school program. So this is, a, this is clearly intended to be an academic program. Because it's grant funded, we are hoping that there will be no cost, certainly to the district or these children. However, we all know that grants, you know, can go away. And so I felt when I put it before you that I needed to calculate out a cost that would not only uh, obviously make sure that we would break even on this, but also uh, have a, 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 make sure there would be a little bit that would build up the revolving fund if we needed to have one so that we could make the program sustainable. That is what the $4 calculation does. I don't believe we are going to need it this year or next year, okay? Obviously, to project much further than that is very hard to do, uh, not knowing what the federal government is going to do with Title I grant funds. Mrs. Principe? Through you to uh, Mr. Wigan. Did we have any excess uh, Title I funds for 2012 that we could carry over to 2013 budget? We, Do you know? we have a very little bit, but the, the sort of the rules of Title I have changed. Uh, folks, part of how Title I and Title IIA are handled changed when we were granted the waiver. And part of the change is now this need to reserve 20% of the Title I grant for purposes like this. So there's not only a, this is the before school program at the elementary level, we have coming before you now. Uh, I'm fairly positive we're going to be coming forward with an after school program at some point as well. But that we, we're not ready to propose that to you at this time. Well, I'm trying to understand that did the new regulation, did we reserve a 20%? This, this, yes, in the grant, we, we know our grant funding is going to be approximately 830000 so we're reserving, I think the reserve works out to be about 200000 206000 So part of that 206000 would be going to fund this. All right. Dr. Domingo? Uh, yes, through you to the business manager. Since uh, as the district, we're defined as the Title I district, I understand that all the children at every elementary building are entitled to uh, Title I services, academic Correct. support or whatnot. Um, I'm interested to know um, how will this program be accommodated if, um, if you have a lot of children deciding to participate in the program knowing that you have proposed two teachers at each building. That to me indicates a very limited 
services that could be offered. Um, and I don't know the setting, but teacher per student ratio may skyrocket very quickly if a large population of students decide to take advantage of this program, then what do we do? Well, I think, quite frankly, if, if the demand is high and obviously the success is, is great, I think um, certainly my feeling is we would obviously want to find a way to make it uh, workable for those children. Uh, I think that it is such that built into sort of the, the budget we've been thinking about for this program that we can easily, within the, the constraints of the grant, expand another teacher at each school or if one school let's say was more popular than another just let's say go to four in one school maybe another school didn't support it as much so I mean I think there's some flexibility that we still have within that reserve that we have for title one um, initially I mean again if it was hugely successful and in huge demand obviously we're gonna have to come back and revisit and figure out how the plan would work but I think initially you know we're really comfortable uh, Amy Allen's been working with the three principals on this I think Everybody is pretty comfortable with you know the initial design of the plan, and again, um, my feeling is always if something is really popular and really successful, then it's up to me to figure out how to make it work. Uh, am I to assume that this projection of two teachers was based on the indicated interest in yes. certain buildings? Yes. For the number, and what would the number of students be that these two teachers? We're we're, would we're, we're figuring that it's um, <sighs> approximately 15 per teacher. So 30 students per building are expected to take advantage? Yep. That would be the maximum that we would have. Mrs. Principal. Ma Madam Chair, if I, if I can just... Go um, right ahead, sorry. Um, it, it's not part of the vote, but I, I would like to bring up again something that we uh, definitely, I would like to discuss for the, the school committee, not, uh, not tonight, obviously. But we have talked over the years of really restructuring potentially Title I usage of funds for mm -hmm. exactly what now appears to be becoming mandatory after and before school programs. And uh, I'm interested to know whether we're, uh, and Mr. Ely probably would be better positioned to answer this question, are we at all thinking about uh, restructuring it in a way that would now expand into after school program, which I think yes. is very important. A lot of our parents um, you know, do not get home in time for, especially the youngsters when they're home, and it, it would be smart to think about regularly scheduled after-school programming with Title I funds. Just First of all, let me try to follow up on something that Mr. Wigan said earlier and that kind of glossed over a little bit. The Title I and Title IIA grants used to be separate applications, separate pools of money, and now they have been combined in what they call a consolidated application. The consolidated application has uh, just about 4,000 strings attached to it. Uh, so uh, you, you have to be very careful what you do, but that set aside is earmarked for uh, auxiliary programming and enhancement and, and uh, uh, reinforcement, and you can target it. You, you know, we, we are school-wide in our elementary schools, Title I, but because we have underachieving populations, we can target the, these programs to those populations. We've just chosen not to take that approach. We believe if a student needs help, we should be there to help them. Uh, so I agree with you 100%. We need to look at our uh, before and after school programs and, and really create what I would refer to as a latch key program. Uh, it's an old term, I know, but it, it's sort of a before school, after school wraparound program that allows a student to be in an academic setting for a longer period of time. Uh, and it accommodates those parents who have before and after, day, after uh, school daycare issues. But it will, for us, it needs to be a targeted academic program with, with, I would think, some recreational component as well, if we really look into it. But, but certainly a conversation that Naomi and I have started having with the principals. I mean, t Title I funds, uh, by my knowledge, uh, are not direct, th th they are not limiting the use of the funds uh, to the to the during the during the day usage, they are really to to enable the population that is under underprivileged and underachieving in any way we see fit. So if they say 20% has to be spent, we can spend 60 yeah. if we decide to. So they're not limiting our ability to structure these programs. I don't want people to think that Title I funds have to be used during the school day. No, actually, That's our they, choice. they don't. The, 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 exactly. The, the title programs yeah. are designed to yeah. enhance the education of any child, uh, specifically child, children who are in poverty. 
and underachieving. Uh, what they have said in the most recent uh, legislation and changes in legislation is they would like to see school districts migrate away from putting uh, personnel, payroll into the Title I application. The problem with that is I've been in four states and seven districts, and I will tell you everybody uses their Title I money to offset payroll. But that doesn't make it right. Well, if you think about it, it's all usually paid for. You're paying for uh, reading teachers, math teachers to do, uh, to do what we refer to as remedial work. Uh, our issue right now, to be honest with you, Dr. Domenko, is something that Amy and I have talked about, is we need to do some program evaluation to decide whether we're getting any bang for our buck. And we haven't done the program evaluation, which is what we will do this year to see whether or not our kids are getting a value added from that program. And then we'll redo our application uh, okay. to, to, to fashion it to a more useful program for our children. I apologize, Madam Chairman. Uh, this is clearly a topic for a different discussion. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Mrs. Principe? To you, to Mr. Wiggin. How is transportation affected um, since the elementary school start? one hour later than the uh, middle high school and this calls for this the same time frame Typic typically when you have a before school program or for that matter an after school program the transportation to the before school program is usually by the parent and in the after school program usually the pickup is by the parent and again i've done before and after school programs in other districts and that's typically the way it works All right. dr o'leary did you have a question um, I did, and it, it may have been answered, but I, I appreciate it. I'll just reiterate. Sure. It seems a, a little uh, ambiguous. The program would be designed to be academically enriching and supportive of children needing assistance and not simply an early drop-off option for parents. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little confused, but you don't have to be academically in need to, uh, to, to uh, go to this program. No, under the regulations, we're a school-wide program, so even if the child is not a child of poverty, they are eligible because we're school-wide and not targeted as assistance school. I mean, I mean not, not um, in, in need in other ways, I mean academically. Um, you said a uh, Any child's eligible. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lazo. <clears throat> I'm having a tug of war with these issues that keep become, uh, under a, a report of the business manager. Um, with all due respect, Terry, I know you're the business manager. I would have liked to see this one straight from the superintendent, which is the educational leader. I think he articulates the message of what has to happen. I'm just not getting the information on the program. Right. Uh, you want me to vote the money, which we're only in charge of the money and policy as school committee, but what what's I'm having a tug of war with the program. I don't know the program. I, I haven't heard the program, and we're going to do it, you know, kind of quick in the end of the, you know, before we start, we're rushing into it again. For myself, usually, what we would have is uh, somebody present the program through the superintendent. We understand the program. We believe in the program, and then we fund the program, and then the business manager would present the funding mechanism on how it works. This is how I, I kind of see it happening, and, and, and what I'm seeing here is I'm hearing about the finance. Don't worry, we got the money to do it. I'm happy about that, and I'm sure that it's probably all right, but I don't know anything about the program itself. I know that we impact on an ELT program. Um, when I was under the impression it was about, you know, helping the learning uh, process and it ended up into a lot of arts and crafts and various other stuff, dancing, which I didn't know when it started. So I'm kind of cautious, mm -hmm. optimistic. Um, but I would like to know more about it. I don't know if uh, the superintendent can do it tonight or if we can have a presentation or is it too late to have one or are we already putting this in gear? I mean, I, was, I would certainly be willing to have Ms. Allen and the principals come in and do a presentation on what their program would look like. I think that it needs to come from the people who have been planning, the, planning it. I think, I, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the plan to start this is on the 24th of September. So you have a meeting, I think, on the 11th. Uh, on the 11th, yeah. yes. So, I mean, I think certainly if the committee feels that they would like a presentation, I don't think that's a problem. My, my point is, if we're starting it in September, I wish we would have saw this a little early. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the, uh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I, I, wagging the dog? I, no, I, trust me, I, I understand. Okay. Mrs. McLaughlin? Um, yeah, I had a question relative to the program itself, and I was hoping that uh, somebody could address that, perhaps the superintendent. Um, 
and it goes along with something Dr. Domenico was asking, is that are, how are, are children broadly going to be notified? Are parents going to broadly be notified this is available? Are they targeting certain children initially to let them know? I know it will be open to everybody, but is it, you know, if right now they're anticipating 60 slots. Are really 60 well, slots going to fill? Well, what I'm hearing tonight is, is this is probably a motion that should be withdrawn, mm -hmm. and we should have the the principals and the director of curriculum instruction assessment come in, do a presentation on the 11th to tell you exactly what the program will look like before you vote on it. That would be my suggestion. Right. I concur. Um, Dr. Domenico. Madam Chair, I make a motion to table uh, this issue until the presentation on the program has been being completed whenever that happens to be. Second. Okay. We have a motion to table and a second. Is there a discussion? Um, do we have, there's nothing about withdrawing the other one? No. We no, to. they're making okay. a motion to table. Mrs. Donovan? No. I think my, my question I was the same as Dr. O'Leary. Should we just simply withdraw this motion and it'll be put on for the next agenda? Uh, Mr. Lager. Just ask. A motion, the, the proper motion would be to table to the next meeting, which is a specific date, then you can table it. A motion to postpone to the next meeting date does the same thing. It, it's. You know, there was no, okay. you know, I'm not it. trying to fancy it up, but yep. a motion to table to the next meeting, then it's the next meeting, second, you vote it, and it's on the next meeting. What you're doing as a school committee is you're actually uh, sending the message to management that you, are, you want this on the next agenda. If you withdraw the motion to table, then it's an option on good faith that you all understand it. I think uh, the parliamentary move to, to guarantee it on the next agenda item is, is more of a a good move by government. So we have a motion to table it to the next meeting, which would be our September 11th meeting. And we have a second in. And any more discussion? We'll have a roll call. Oh, did you have any more discussion? No. no? Everybody's good? Roll call on that, Max, please. Mrs. Donovan? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. McLaughlin? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Dr. Domingo? Yes. Seven yes. Motion passes, so we'll have this on the agenda again on September 11th. Thank you. Item number eight, the distribution of the FY13 budget. Mr. Wiggins. They're, they're coming your way. Um, this, is, this is pretty much it. I will tell you there's, it's still a snapshot in time to a degree. You will see some red highlights from time to time. Those are budget numbers. Uh, because either there's a position that we've maybe had a resignation that we're still waiting on a final interview to to uh, set salary for that person. Um, I had a couple of, I think there was a resignation I just actually got in my hands today uh, for a paraprofessional. Um, so that's a position obviously that's in there that is going to change uh, with a new hire. Um, I would say that, you know, the pluses and minuses all right now look pretty good as we start the year. Uh, one thing that is really positive is the impact of the new um, two work experience programs. Uh, it looks like we will probably reduce our outer district tuitions in excess of $400,000. Um, and I would also say we still really haven't taken into account the reduction in transportation that we will have once those new vans, you know, get purchased and or get leased and, and get into play. And uh, Dr. Domingo? M Madam Chair, I respectfully request that uh, we not discuss this item. It was just handed to us. I would like to request that a, a, a budget of transportation facilities subcommittee meeting be scheduled for next Absolutely. week uh, based on availability of the members. Uh, okay. And this definitely needs to be on the, on the agenda. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. All right, so we'll move on. And if unless there's anything else on this, we'll discuss it when we have our, we'll make the budget meeting. The next one is the distribution of the preliminary FY12 end of year budget. And, and actually, if that's going to happen, that would actually maybe be a good time for me to distribute that. I was hoping to have that for you tonight as well. I could not, uh, there's something that Karen and I need to do to clean up before we can distribute that final version of the FY12 budget. Um, I actually was thinking of mailing it out to you at the end of this week, which I may still do, but that is something also we could do at the budget uh, transportation and facility, or yeah, budget facilities and Transportation Committee. Okay, great. Anyone else? Dr. Domingo? Madam Chair, I extend the exact same wording and request for these 
this line item to be included on the agenda yeah. for the okay. uh, budget subcommittee meeting. All right. All right, item number 10. We will need a motion from the Southbridge School Committee to authorize the school business manager to write a letter to the town manager requesting reimbursements for or purchases of equipment for the new middle high school not to exceed $112,000 said funds to come from either the school building construction fund of the contribution to free cash or, from It should say or, I apologize. Or or the contribution to free cash from the fiscal year 2012 school budget ending fund balance. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, second. I have a second. We have a motion and a second, and I will have discussion on this item. Mr. Wiggins, you want to explain? Yeah, I'll try to do it without getting too emotional here. Um, as you know, I pride myself on my financial projections. Um, and over the years, I've been pretty good at it. And I was pretty sure I knew where we were going to be. And then, lo and behold, June came along, and it looked like I had really blown my projections on salaries. And I have to tell you that I spent a good part of the month of June, uh, and even a little bit in early July, as somewhat of a nervous wreck, because I thought I had missed something horribly. I did. KBS had been carrying encumbrances from 2011 in the budget. And so it looked like I had salaries that I was going to need to pay, and I didn't need to pay. But in the meantime, I couldn't give you folks in June a report of what the anticipated fund balance would be so that you could make certain commitments that we had been talking about for months. And it has taken, and really until early August, to get this issue nailed down. In the meantime, there were some things that happened as well that we needed to address, most notably the network switches, which topped the list, which right now have been dealt with in the FY13 budget. But they're really something related to the construction, and it is something we may be able to get back out of the construction, which is why I suggested the wording of the motion the way I did. But at the moment, because of, and again, I talk about the issue that we have had, and we are appealing this issue with the MSBA, about how they have not reimbursed us for a significant aspect of moisture mitigation, and we are not alone in appealing this. There are multiple school districts around the state in the same boat. Um, but that just created a situation where we couldn't take, we just couldn't take the chance of necessarily putting that into the construction budget. So the money that you previously approved for prepaid tuition left a fund balance of 259000 and change. Of that, about $100,000, and Scott and I have been in the meeting, so we, we heard about the fire radios and some needs the police had. It, there was always kind of a commitment that we said we were going to make sure and that if they didn't give us the actual purchases before June 30th, that we were going to set aside $100,000 of what we were trying to come forward with the fund balance for those purposes. That leaves $159,000, close to $160,000 that right now is free cash, okay? That wouldn't be free cash, quite frankly, had you folks been able to make the decisions you should have been able to make. What I'm asking you to endorse is my writing the town manager a letter requesting that he allocate from what is now going to be free cash, but it's free cash that you generated in good faith to make certain obligations, mostly related to the new school. In fact, I think they're all related to the new school, okay, as soft costs, which frequently come up with new construction. It's not an unusual thing. I've done nine projects. There's always been some soft costs that come up that have to be absorbed in the school budget or from a fund balance. And I've listed them out for you there, okay? Um, the town manager can obviously take that letter and he can ignore it. He could endorse it, propose it to town council. Town council could say no. Um, town council could say yes. But I think it's worth making the request. Um, at the end of the day, if this request is granted, there's still $100,000 of the free cash we're sending forward that's going to be there for the fire and police. For them, the needs that they have related to the new school, that would still leave $48,000 worth of change of free cash, free and clear, you know, for the town to have. Um, so again, um, 
I didn't feel I could do that unilaterally without bringing it to the committee for your discussion and your input and, frankly, your approval. But I would respectfully ask that you give me the authority to write this letter. Dr. Domenico? Madam Chair, through you to the business manager. Um, as you explained, when it was discovered that this money was actually left over in the school operating budget, it was way too late to do anything yes. in order for us to use these that funds. That is my intent. This being part of operating budget, uh, expenses that you are trying to get reimbursed for, uh, my first two items are my question. Additional network switches and wall plates to install phones. Is there such a thing as a separate budget for construction and new building? Uh, and where was this budgeted before in our operating budget? Well, these two things, these two, well, the, you have a budget for um, network technology. Yeah. And you have a budget for telephone. Yeah. Um, uh, so these two things are covered in your budget, okay? The, uh, the network switch issue, again, that's an issue that, quite frankly, I hope to get back in the construction budget. Okay, that should but be in construction budget. Should, not in yeah, no, I, because my position is that this is something that I think um, there are a couple of different contingencies that, quite frankly, I believe it ought to come out of. But at the until we get to the end of the project uh, and we have a meeting, and there's a meeting that always happens at the end of the project where there's a lot of tough questions that are gone through, and this is one of those tough questions that has gone through. Um, in the meantime, we needed to get the network working. Um, I understand that. Uh, so I would, I would ask maybe a follow-up question. Uh, clearly, we have spent $29,000 out of our operating budget on, on the cost associated with the new building. Correct. Uh, would you be kind enough to provide us with, uh, with a summary of all the costs for the new building that were actually covered our, under our operating budget? Uh, for which I really have I, no recollection on, on voting last year. I did not think that we were including the cost associated with the new building within our operating budget. For the current buildings, yes, and maybe Scott can explain this better, but uh, I would like to have an idea how much as a, of our operating budget is getting invested now into, into the new building as well. Mr. Lazo? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Terry, uh, the, mediate, the, the remediation of the water, I mean, excuse me, remediation of the water and stuff. There were a lot of question marks with the state, and I know that we had a meeting on how fast we're getting this reimbursement uh, to town side. It doesn't come to school side. Um, what's happened during this project, I think your question is valid, and, um, and, and, and it's a good one as far as finding out the numbers. But the thing is, right now, we're shaking out the final numbers. Casigli hasn't put in all the change orders and the final numbers on their end. Uh, we had a meeting. Uh, today and we sat down and talked about it but what this has been is kind of a give and take uh, with the we had the police department the fire department the DPW uh, and the school system uh, Mike and, and everything it's, it's been a give and take as far as trying to get to the finish line uh, I know that you heard everybody on time and on the budget and we're very very confident we turn money back to the state um, our thing is if the state has some I don't know in the final requisitions that we've been sending out to them uh, their invoice to say this is what it is. Uh, it's that's why the building committee is going to be still in power until probably November, so we can shake out all the final numbers. As far as sending a letter to the town manager, I know that Terry, myself, uh, and, and I know Eric's been at some of the meetings or most of them, that we we sit down and it's been a good dialogue. The council's been fantastic uh, with this project uh, as far as. It's one of the few times in the 29 years I've been involved at the school committee, the council, department heads. It's been one big pull in the same direction. And I think at this point here, here's where the tire hits the road. It's the finish line. And we are going to be on time and under budget, I'm confident, uh, via no surprises from the state. But at the same time, when we do this, you'll notice you go to the school and you see a concrete slab, but you don't see a building out there, storage, because the state won't fund it. And we didn't want to raise taxes by building it when we built the school. So we did a creative thing of, in the project, the slab is there, the electrics run, we'll go to Bay Path and we will build these later. So I think you're gonna see some of these things, maintenance equipment for the, uh, for the um, soccer goals and you look at some of this stuff. I think in good faith going to the manager and say, look, this is what happened, this is what we've got, and we think this is kind of meeting us halfway. 
I think Terry's approach is, is, is appropriate, and I think as a school committee, uh, to get those numbers is a good question. To get them right now, I don't think they're actually available until we actually shake out the final numbers. I think in uh, the next week we're supposed to get the final uh, numbers from Casigli. It's supposed to be plugged in on the downside. Um, and they'll, they'll hash out what, uh, whether it's an architectural cost, whether it goes to Casigli or goes to the town. So there's still some, some, some number crunching to happen. But as far as tonight's agenda item, uh, I think it's a good thing to, to extend to the town side and say, look, because it's been a give and take in that boardroom, and it's been, uh, you know, I think in, in good faith, it's, it's been a good work. It's been a fantastic, and fantastic run for the last uh, X amount of years. But uh, I would say I'll vote in favor of it and see whether the town manager and the council sit with this. They've been more than fair with us today. Any other discussion? If none, oh, Mrs. Donovan? That's okay, That's okay. thank you. I have a question through you to Mr. Wigan. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the uh, excuse me, Dr. Domingo had mentioned the first two items on that mm -hmm. list. The rest of those items, what is their origin? Was this a, a list of items that we wanted to purchase but didn't know if we would have the money for, so they were set aside, and now that we know that we have the funds, we're going back to some type of list? These, I, are, these, are, these are all items that were part of our original FF&E. Our what? Uh, I'm sorry, furniture, fixtures, and equipment list. Okay. Okay. Um, we either did not get bids on them, or really what is more to the point at this is that when we got everything else, it was quite frankly of a higher priority, kind of the must-haves, uh, though I would tell you the tractor and the utility vehicle and the golf cart are pretty much must-haves. Um, there simply wasn't enough money in the FF&E budget um, to pay for these. Again, Eric and I and, and the committee at all was kind of understanding the reason we had a freeze all year is we knew there were going to be some things conceivably that were things that we were going to need for the new school that we were not going to necessarily have the budget for. It happens in projects all the time. Uh, again, this is my ninth project. Um, I have yet to do a project where I haven't had to find some money for things that were needed in the new school when we got to the end. Um, Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of these things, most of these things are not covered under uh, the MSBA, so there, there's no reimbursement not, for them anyway. Not unless you can fit them into that magical budget that the MSBA sets. Right. The okay. other thing with the technology is that one of the, and again, I wasn't here at the time, and I'm not criticizing anybody when I say this, so please don't take this as a criticism of, of anyone. In every other project that I have ever built where technology is involved, and that's quite a few, the phone system and the network have been part of the construction budget. In this project, they were part of the technology budget. So we essentially started really in kind of a half a million dollar hole in technology because normally that million two that we would have for a technology budget, we would have for just student-based technology. Whoops. My glasses is down. Um, and instead of that, we had to take, you know, a, a sizable chunk of that budget, you know, for the network and the phones because it wasn't part of the construction budget. And that's created a problem. And again, one of the reasons why it got exasperated when you know, someone in the design team, um, again, an issue we will have at the end of the project, um, did not make us aware of 167 different data points that required eight additional switches. Okay. Um, just a follow-up question, just for clarification. So for the first two items, are we seeking reimbursement, and the rest of the items yes. we're seeking purchases? That's correct. And as far as the process for making those, does the town cut you a check for the first two items and give us another check to purchase the rest, or will they purchase it on our behalf, or how does the actual um, given, given purchase the fact, Given place. the fact that it is um, spanning fiscal years, I think actually it probably will be the fact that in the first two items it would be revenue, so it will probably essentially be a, a check, albeit probably more of an electronic transfer. Yep. Uh, on the other items, um, actually be a little bit up to the town manager. Um, he, it's very possible that in some towns when, I, when I've been allowed to use free cash, I will do a purchase order against an account that the town manager will give me, and simply the purchase order is charged against that particular account and it doesn't go through school accounts. Okay, and if we were to approve this motion this evening, 
um, what's the timeline that you would write the letter to the town manager and then in turn hear back from him uh, and report to, it'll, to it'll us go where out we're standing? It'll, it'll be okay. waiting for him when he comes back from vacation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Lazar. Just, just a quick uh, comment. I think uh, Kara asked valid questions, and I think that uh, if you look at this list, and I do agree that the first two should have been in the construction, um, but there's a lot of things that ended up in the construction, if it's interior equipment for, for uh, polishing floors, washing floors, you know, everything's handled differently by the state, uh, how it's supposed to work. But this is technically like capital, and capital improvements normally don't come out of your educational dollars. Right. And I think that's where, you know, this, this whole unique process that we went through with the state, the new building, and our budget, I think that all departments, all people at the table worried about one thing, completing it and getting that high school done the way it should be done with the equipment to maintain it. And at the same time, uh, if, if, if the fire department and the police department were helped out because of the project with uh, radios or whatever to connect that 133 TV uh, cameras to the police station, it was all for the safety of the kids and the completion of the project. And I think that the team concepts would have made it happen. Mrs. McLaughlin. Um, thank you. Uh, through you to Mr. Wigan. Um, regarding the moisture mitigation issue, so $100,000 has probably been spent on moisture mitigation issues that you're appealing well, to the state? Yeah, it's more like 400 and was it 486000 was total? Yeah. Something like that. But there was an allowance in this $100,000 yeah. was and above. Here's, without telling everybody more about moisture mitigation <laughs> than they ever wanted to know, yeah. in construction yeah. projects you have allowances. <laughs> And what the MSBA has done in the past, until this year, is they see the allowance and they approve the allowance as part of your budget. But then they, they will reimburse on the actual expenditure. So if the moisture mitigation cost us 200000 they would have only reimbursed us on 200000 Prior to this year, if the, if the moisture mitigation cost us 600000 they would have reimbursed us on 600000 This year, they changed the rules. And that is the basis of the appeal, as I say, for multiple school districts. Lucky us. But I have a question, though, related to that. If money does end up coming back to the district for that, will that money be reverted to the town? Well, 80% of that money would come to the town. It would okay. be town money. Okay. Dr. Domenico, did you have a... Yeah, I, I okay. would just like to say I, I, I'm excited to support, to, to support this motion, and I would really like to urge the council uh, to support this motion for us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lazo, anything else? Uh, just a question on that mitigation. I know the superintendent and business manager love talking about it. <laughs> it's something that browbeat us. Anytime you go with the rubber flooring, which is the state-of-the-art stuff that everybody's going with, I was talking to the building chairman of the um, Grafton School and these other schools that went with the rubber, and they, they ran right into this mitigation. And we're all sitting there saying that nobody ever heard of it before because they usually lay, laid vinyl tile. And vinyl tile you can lay directly on, you don't have to mitigate. So uh, I'll be happy when the project's done. If I had never hear the word mitigation, it would be fine. But uh, it's not like somebody did something wrong. Somebody left the project and said, something's wrong with the concrete. And, and no, it's uh, in order for the glue to stick, because it's a green school, we didn't want the, the, uh, the powerful glues. We went with the uh, latex base, your know, water base. So, what happens is you can't have water in the slab. We tried to mitigate it, and they ended up having to do a certain process that cost it extra. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. McLaughlin. Just quickly, I didn't mean to imply that any uh, funny business had happened at all. Um, I just wanted the public to know that if money does come back, it would revert to the town. Mm -hmm. That's right. all I wanted to know. Thank you. Any other discussion? I just have um, one thing that I'd like to put upon everybody is I think that the letter should come from all of us as a group rather than just Terry, um, from all of us to uh, at least sign it. I mean, Terry can, of course, write it and all that, but I think it would be nice if, if everybody on the committee sent the letter out to the, to the uh, town manager. Would that be all right with everyone? Okay. All right. So if there's no further discussion, can we have the uh, roll call vote, please? Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. McLaughlin? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Dr. Domenko? Yes. Mrs. Donovan? Yes. Seven yes. Thank you. So the motion, motion passes.
Um, our last agenda item is executive session, which we will not be having this evening. So our next item is for adjournment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. And a second. All those in favor? Thank you. And just a reminder to the public, our next meeting will be September 11th at 7 p.m. Thank you.